There's no question about it, these unkind fates. This cruel, cruel society is pursuing you, a sensitive, infinitely intelligent being, to the very edge of the abyss. There's no doubt about it. And you've come to the right spot. Friendly, yes, we extend our hand in abject understanding and total perception of the fact that you, the beautiful people, have gathered and have come to the right place. Isn't terrible with so many rotten people in the world? So awful, so many awful people who don't understand really good, honest, real things. Ah, terrible. Yes, you've got this golden keys of that. Bring it up there, Donald, please. Just a gigolo, everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. Paid for every dance, selling each romance, every night some heart betraying. There will come a day, <laughs> youth will pass away, then what will they say about me? When the end comes, I know, they'll say just a chick alone, as life goes on without me. Very good. I knew I'd milk that. Oh, man. Timing is of the essence. You notice that, baby? Nothing to it. Hold it there. Yes, uh, of course, uh, the straws in the wind department here, occasionally, can I mind if I rustle up the straws in the wind? You know, uh, speaking of straws in the wind, uh, everywhere you see, everywhere you look, animalophilia is beginning to sneak into our world. Now, now I'm, not, I'm not necessarily talking about the anthropomorphism, <laughs> which is something else again. This is animalophilia. This is people who are animal nuts. Now, that does not necessarily mean that they, that they uh, make the animal into a human being, which is Walt Disneyville. This is a Walt Disney syndrome. This is another thing entirely. Have you seen some of the new fantastic commercials that are on television that exploit animal, animal Ophelia to its extremist sense? How about the one where you see this guy, you know, and he's got a, he's got a roughly apron. You've seen this guy? And he's in this kitchen. It's a typical east side hippie uh, sort of, uh, oh, uh, Vogue type kitchen. You can see the, the Russian kettles hanging from the walls and all. And he's going, oh, he's got that swinging Westchester jaw, too, and a little slight Harvard accent. He's going, oh, oh what the little darling love is. Oh, my, what the little darling is going. And just a little soup sound of salt. Oh, a little salty, walty, walty. And now a little pepper. Ta -ta -ta. Oh, that pepper grinder. La ta ta. Oh, that, what the little darling is going to love this beef a -rooney. And you think this guy is preparing a fantastic feast for his chick, who's about to come over to the pad for dinner. Oh, yeah, the little darling. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, I can hardly wait till I see you. Ma -ta -ta -na. And then he takes the plate. He takes this, this, this French skillet uh, full of... Uh, Meatballs sizzling and hissing, and he turns us, come and get it, darling. And the quick cut is to an Afghan hound. Going, <laughs> and so, oh, my little darling, talk about anima Ophelia. For those of you who don't know what's going on in New York, in good hot weather here in New York, especially over there in the East 50s, I am reminded once again of those faint odors, those faint aromas used to come floating out of the stockyards on the south side of Chicago that made watching the Chicago White Sox a very special experience. You'd see that green miasma, that, that kind of soft aroma, that, that, uh, that, that halo effect that hangs over 17 freight cars full of hogs 
come floating in over third base, and you knew that the afternoon was going to be like all other afternoons of defeat, despondent, slow swimming upstream against a turgid river containing an infinite variety of things, cabbages and kings. This was the world of the Chicago White Sox, and I'm reminded of that on hot days as I walk along over the East 50s, uh, treading carefully, uh, that the, <laughs> the, the, the terrain on the East 50s is very, very difficult on hot afternoons. As far as the eye can see, Afghans. Uh, corgis, isn't that what they call them? Or is it congies or whoopies? Uh, corgis? Ah, I see, I don't want to mispronounce the little darling's name properly. Uh, <laughs> everywhere, and you hear the twittering and the humming and the cooing of elderly ladies and tall, thin, willowy men wearing Italian skinny pants. All of them twittering and cooing to their little darlings. Incidentally, if you notice that the, part of this animal Ophelia is, uh, it, part of it is the thing uh, you know how mothers invariably, a certain kind of mother, when a fist fight breaks out involving her kid, it's the other kid who's rotten. This is a special kind of mother. No matter what happens, the kid comes running up the front porch and, yeah, whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa, 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 and he falls in the house and immediately the mother says, who did it, who did it? Tell me who did it. Just tell me who did it. And she goes running out there. What she doesn't know is that little Freddy had just committed a triple axe murder. And they are after him. Oh, ma, ma, ma. Well, it doesn't make any difference with a certain kind of mother. If, if Freddy committed a triple axe murder, it's because they were rotten people and made him do it. And it's their fault anyway. Well, today I am, I'm walking along the east side and there are two thin willowy gentlemen on each side of the sidewalk. One has a dachshund, and uh, it's like one of these little cross-eyed looking dachshunds with a tongue hanging down to the floor, you know, the dumb looking klutzy dog. And the other guy <laughs> has, a, has, has one of these esoteric looking, uh, I, uh, one, of these, one of these very esoteric looking dogs, I don't know, a cross between a congee and I think possibly a water rat, uh, with a little touch of possum thrown in there, and a little, just a little touch of King Kong and possibly a girl he wants to know in T-neck. And there these, these two are, and this one guy, and these two little squirts, these little dogs are about the size of a teacup, you know. And, and, uh, <laughs> and this, I'll tell you, it was a line that was, it was right out of Philip Roth. It was right out of Salinger, except that they would have said it seriously, you see. It was right out of Updike, and I'm going to report it to you because I heard it in all of its purity. I am walking down the middle of the sidewalk, and here I am trapped between these two raging monsters. Uh, total weight, roughly seven and a half ounces, see? And they had the thin little silver chains, and one had little gold earrings on the dog, you know, and the other one had, had little uh, rhinestone buckles and all kinds of jazz on it. And these two guys, both of them were shirts, you see, they're both on each side uh, of the side, well, by, wide sidewalk over there on 2nd Avenue. They were both glaring at each other. And these two little dogs were looking at each other at the end of their leashes, see, there was about three feet between them. They're going, ah, 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 like this, you know, they're insane. Ah, ah, the little dachshund is reaching out with the paws, you know, wanting to tear the other one apart. And the little congi or whatever, corgi or whoopie or whatever it is, it's going, <laughs> it's reaching out with its little claws. And the guy to my left who had the little corgi or congi or whoopie, whatever it was, he says, that's all right. That's the first time you've seen a vicious female. He says, a vicious female. And, <laughs> oh, man, how symbolic can you get? And, and here, this little this little squirt of a tiny toy dachshund was a vicious female, and of course, the, the 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 dog that he had had little tiny eyes that were that were speckled with pure vitriol. Uh, this was this was this was a deadly dog if I've ever seen one. Not capable of any damage, but had this dog had stainless steel fangs, the East Side would not be safe for pedestrians. <laughs> was going, <laughs> he's, come on, dear, you're not used to vicious females. As though, I am. Oh, my, I certainly am. There's mother, for example. Would you please bring that on? That's the Tennessee Williams Syndrome in full flight in midsummer on the east side. Come on, gang, let's go. Let Ben Gazzara try that. <laughs> You know, this uh, this uh, syndrome, though, of the animal 
Ophelia is becoming very... There is an ad. Who, who's got the current uh, New Yorker with him? You got it downstairs, Lee? Can you run down and get it? If you run down and get it and uh, talk about the reversal of the roles and all the rest of it, you get uh, hurry down and get that thing, and while you're doing that, you keep keep uh, Tiger Rag up there, Don. we we got to have that. Uh, here, here, for example, in Dear Abby is another example. Little things are floating down, you know, like... like uh, it's like monster dandruff somewhere. There is a monster that's controlling the whole shebang, and it's got problems. Listen, dear Abby, <clears throat> dear Abby, my French poodle is going to be four years old next Sunday. I would like to give her a surprise birthday party and invite some of her little playmates. Cherie isn't just an ordinary dog. She's an aristocrat, and I have the papers to prove it. What should I serve? Uh, have you any cute original ideas for a party of this time? Cherie's Madame. Well, how do you think Abby answers that? Well, Abby plays it straight. She says, Dear Madame, if you really want to put on the dog, make it black tie. Serve a birthday cake made of ground sirloin and decorate it with crushed dog biscuits. And as for Cherie's papers, you'd just better put them on the floor. <laughs> Give it to him, Abby. <laughs> Jim, why is it that last line reminds me? This is WOR, AM and FM, New York. At the, this is Friendly Fred here. Would you please uh, touch the money button there, Mr. Leader Likes? Go ahead. There we go. Very good. Miller High Life in Pop and Pour cans. Distinctive Miller High Life in Pop cans. Just Pop and Pour Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. No opener needed. And inside every can, enjoy the hearty yet light goodness of Miller High Life. Brewed from a century old recipe, only in Milwaukee. Miller High Life always gives you that perfect taste in beer every time. Always a bright, clear taste. Unequaled, unquestioned, unchanging. Now you can enjoy refreshing Miller High Life in Pop and Pour cans. Pop and Pour Miller High Life. Always sparkling, flavorful, distinctive. Now in Pop and Pour cans. You know, I, I miss something, Don. I have to admit it. Ever since they put this transcription on, I miss those wonderful old stories that the Miller people used to uh, send down for me to talk about. You know, that musty old castle where they originally made Miller High Life. Do you remember that? that musty old castle. Indeed. You know, speaking of a musty old... Very good. Thank you, baby. Very good. Uh, I have a fantastically efficient staff. Dynamic boy, leaping to it. While while we're while we're looking for this ad in the current issue of the New Yorker, I'll tell you. If you will look on the page, all right, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you uh, hold on there for a second. I'll contemplate this. Talk about the reversal of the roles. And uh, well, no, no, I'm not going to show it to you. You're going to have to be surprised. And while you're waiting here, let's do a little Peugeot business here. Uh, Peugeot is the car, according to a current ad, incidentally, it is true, uh, the car that has been dominating the world's roughest rallies the last couple of years. You know, the rally, that reminds me, immediately after this commercial, Don, will you please remind me to talk about a rally? Uh, for those of you who know anything about rallies, you understand, of course, that the East African rally is the world's worst. In 3,000 miles over East Africa, and if you think driving over some of the Long Island roads is rotten, if you think 6th Avenue is tough at uh, rush hour, Dad, you ought to drive. You know that one of my friends almost got killed uh, driving in a, in a car in East Africa in the middle of the jungle, and there wasn't another car within 17,000 miles. He hit the only other car in the jungle, head on. Just like that. They both came around the curb. Boom. Two months in the hospital in the, in the Belgian car. True? One, that, like it's a true story. Not inventing this. Anyway, let's talk about the Peugeot. Uh, last year, 16 cars finished this rally. 85 started. 
and five of the cars that finished were Peugeots. Uh, this is a fantastic automobile. I drove one for five years myself, and it's one of the best cars I've ever owned. And I have owned, let's see, probably 25 automobiles. What a sickness. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, cars are like women. Uh, every time you get one, you want another one. Uh, and a new one, I can appoint it, which is even sicker. Oh, wow. This is Peugeot, 2 East 46th Street. They make it. It's a fine car. It's French, and I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Not because I'm anglicizing it, because I'm terrible in French. Now, let's see. What? I, oh, you want to hear about a rally? Yeah. Uh, this is something uh, I, I uh, want to throw in here. That for, this is the ninth year now, uh, Dan List and myself officiated at a rally. It's the closest thing to a tradition that the Village Voice has got. And for those of you who are looking for something to do Sunday morning, uh, uh, something that has a, a certain surrealistic nuttiness about it, I would suggest that you come down to Washington Square. Now, this is uh, it's not going to cost you anything. I would suggest you come down to Washington Square. On the east side of Washington Square is University Place. Now, sometimes they call it uh, Washington Square East, but it really is the foot of University Place, over on the east side. Washington Square is right in the heart of Manhattan. And uh, all you do is drive straight down Fifth Avenue, if you don't know anything about it. Just drive straight down Fifth Avenue, and you'll hit Washington Square head on. And like as a not, uh, if uh, I know anything about Washington Square on Sunday, it'll hit you head on. There are more fist fights per square inch in Washington Square than any place in New York on Sunday. The fuzz, everybody's out there. Now, over on the east side of Washington Square, at 11 a.m., you will find the Greenwich Village Sports Car Rally with me standing on the hood of a 1933 Hupmobile, wearing a yachting cap, exhorting the crowd to further madness. Uh, standing behind me will be Dan List, the editorial uh, editor. He's the editor of the automotive column of the Village Voice, and we will be engaged in the, the ninth consecutive unsuccessful running of the Greenwich Village Sports Car Rally it will be two hours. Now, this is a kind of anti-rally rally, in case you're interested. This is a two-hour metropolitan rally in which all the drivers drive through the great roars of the crowd, uh, and they have a number on the side of their car, and they're given checkpoints all over New York City. They uh, all wild places down, down uh, in the Battery and uptown, Washington Heights, and so on. And two hours later, if they complete the rally, they wind up at the limelight on 7th Avenue South, and we go in and have, uh, you know, yelling. People come, women get hysterical, and it's terrible. We usually have a nurse on duty down there and all that sort of thing, and a lot of little kids in short pants come over and say, Mr. Shepard, he's had a real beard, and they pull and all that stuff. Terrible thing. The whole thing is a ridiculous fiasco, but it's part of the pop art world of our time. And if you want to come down and be part of this, it is going to be this Sunday at 11 a.m., okay? The rally sponsored by the village. Oh, if you want to enter, now here's one thing. If you want to drive, you don't have to be a great driver. In fact, the worst drivers always win this thing, which is a little ironical. I'll never forget a friend of mine. One night I was going to go down to this rally. You know, they have a big cup. It really is a big deal. You know, They have a big cup, and they have the guy's name inscribed, and it's a kind of a traditional thing. And one night, a friend of mine, uh, the night before, I said, I'm going to this rally. And he said, oh, I'll come over there and watch it. So the next morning, he arrived in his little car, which was a terrible, rotten automobile, one of the worst cars ever built, a mid-European automobile we won't even mention. It had lead wheels. Awful car. Uh, it had, it had, it was the only half cylinder motor I know of around. This car, everything was dripped oil as he drove it down the street. He had to, he had to keep pushing it with his foot to get it started, you know, that kind of thing, out the, out the door, you know. And he comes down there and with his mother in law sitting in the back seat, who weighed 722 pounds. And his wife is sitting next to him. They come down the street. And he, somebody put a number on the side of his car. It was a foreign car, so all medics, he's, he's an entrant. He says, no, no, I'm, I'm walking. They says, all right, all right, next in line, get going. He drives out. 25 minutes and an hour and a half later, he wins the silver cup. And he has not been back since, which bugged the whole crowd because it was a cup that was supposed to go from winter to winter. They haven't found him yet. He took off. But uh, <laughs> if you'd like to enter, call the Village Voice tomorrow at Watkins 4 4669 after 9 o'clock, and ask for Dan List. 
Now, it doesn't make any difference what kind of car you have. If you want to enter this thing, they're particularly interested in cars. Uh, if you have an old Essex, great, they'd love to have. And by the way, down at the sports car rally, there will be a lot of classic cars on display down. There's a couple of Duesenbergs. There'll be uh, one of the old wind-driven Maytags, the only car that was on the road ever that used sails. Did you know that they had a, a, an automobile that was put on the market that had a sail and had an auxiliary sail? And uh, this this will be on display down there, and it will be driven by the original owner, who's was 140. And uh, it's an exciting world, I'll tell you. All right, now let's see. That's Peugeot. Now one other thing, uh, <laughs> we have to we have to con have to conclude here. You know, it's funny funny scene about about this this uh, this animal world. Uh, do you want to know about the? Uh, you want to hear about this piece in the New Yorker? All right, I would suggest any of you who want the boff of the week. To pick up your current copy of the New Yorker, July 31st, it, I always say that there is an unconscious truth in the things we do in, a, in an unselfconscious way. Now, when a guy is sitting down to write a play, he is self-conscious. Immediately, all the things that he is supposed to believe come out. Now, that doesn't mean he really believes them in life. That's what confuses people about writers constantly. And, and about people who are editorialists, one thing and another. The, on one hand, they will talk about peace. They'll talk about uh, the beauty of the human soul. They will constantly berate and bewail the fact that there are cruel people in the world and evil people. And at the same time, they themselves, for the time, stabbing their girlfriends and wives with seven-inch shivs. Now, that confuses people. They, it really does. Many times you will see on television, you'll see in a, you know, in a roundtable discussion of the David Susskind tradition, you'll see some author who claims he's of the people. He has written great books, uh, uh, raising to the sky the noble savage. He has talked about the wonderful little man. And the next thing you know, you see him on TV, and he says, Well, of course, David, as far as I say, well, of course, when I went to Yale, where you find out he's totally the opposite of what he claims he is, or at least what you think his books are about. Uh, I wonder how many kids who think if they ran into J.D. Salinger on the street, Salinger would be a 16-year-old kid with pimples. And he'd grab and say, Hey, man, come on, let's put on our honey caps, let's go out the corner like that, let's go, kids, wow. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am S-O-R-Y-E. Sorry. Now, I think just like this, in the world of the unconscious creation, you'll often find the greatest truth. Merely because the guy is not concerned with, uh, uh, with values that he, he, uh, he, he thinks he should believe in. He is just working. In other words, the working thing often is the thing which is the thing that ultimately is the truth about a society. I doubt very much whether whether uh, we will find, I, I suspect that if our museums right now were to be preserved, if somehow you could pour uh, a polyethylene film, you know, put them in mothballs like they do the mothball feet, the fleet, you know, just seal them up and uh, pump all the air out of them and to make sure that no humidity gets into them and 2,000 years from now they were to split this thing open I suspect they would learn absolutely nothing about our society. Nothing at all. On the other hand, if they were to find 45 copies of the Saturday Evening Post, 17 copies of Playboy in full flight, they would know about our society. Far more than if they were to some very important novel by, say, William Faulkner. Or some very important novel by Catherine Ann Porter. I suspect this, and, I, and I'm going to continue to suspect it, because now that's not to say there's more truth in these people who write the junk, uh, these people who are involved. It's it's they're unselfconscious, and hence are perhaps more truthful. And they don't even know about truth; they're just writing it. You know, they're just putting it down. They're laying it out. Uh, I wonder whether or not what would be more. This is a rhetorical question here. What would be more valuable? to a man who wants to know about a society, let's say ours, the Museum of Modern Art, I'm talking about 2,000 years from now, which is supposed to represent the flower of our creativity. Now, is an artist supposed to comment on a society? Is he supposed to record it? 
Is he supposed to make it understandable? To whom, then, I ask? That's a good question. Now, 2,000 years from now, if they dig up Andy Warhol, are they going to know much about our time? I wonder. I really seriously wonder. Now, on the other hand, I suspect that if they could find uh, maybe 27 cubic yards of the Bronx City dump, they would know. They would seriously really know. To begin with, they would find 847 million used Miller High Life cans. Immediately they know here was a beer swigging population. <laughs> I mean, immediately there is a here's a crowd that swilled beer. They would find 422 old back copies of TV Guide with the uh, with the who on the cover, you know, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie maybe. <laughs> but the facts of the matter are, by looking at these truly uh, un unprepossessing pieces of business that we turn out, you would find out about our time. Now look at this ad now. This tells a lot about our world. I would suggest you get out your current copy of the New Yorker and right opposite the Talk of the Town page. The Talk of the Town begins on page uh, 23 is the Talk of the Town. They don't have it numbered, but it is page 23. Right opposite that is a fantastic picture. And it starts out and says, There is a certain kind of woman. Holy smokes, and how? Whose name is George. <laughs> Now that that chick. Now now I, I I hold this up. I'm not even gonna, you know it doesn't, it doesn't matter whose ad it is, but the point is that this girl is in exactly the same situation. Uh, she's in the same setting and has the same attitude of a male of about eight years ago in the ads, including even the artifacts around her. Do you notice the dog she's with? These are not girl dogs. These are what they used to call male masculine. These are hunting dogs. Obviously, these are, uh, what are they? Uh, they look like uh, Dalmatians, aren't they? Or setters, some kind, of a, some kind of a hunting dog. But obviously, they're field dogs. These are not lap dogs. Uh, these are not little she-she French poodles. These are the kind of dogs that you used, to, you used to see pictures, you know, with Cary Grant surrounded by this type of dog wearing a Tweety jacket. Now, do you notice what she's stepping out of? Well, she's stepping out of a very hairy, racing-type automobile. Now, there is no male in the picture, so it's obvious that she is the one who's operating this equipment. It's exactly the kind of picture that you used to see a male in about five or six years ago. Now, notice the look on her face. Notice everything about her. Can you imagine cuddling that chick? <laughs> Seriously, no, actually, that's a good question. And now, that relates to what I was talking to you last night about. Can you imagine cuddling her? Now, I, was, I would like to point out the hair she's wearing. Now, that's pure Tom Jones and a yard wide. Look carefully at it. Really. And, uh, and, and you'll see so much about our society. Now, uh, 50 years from now, of course, they'll dig this out. Look at this. And they will know that something happened in the 60s. Merely by relating this to a picture of the same situation that was done in the 50s, in the mid-50s. They can see a vast and fantastically sweeping change coming over, uh, coming over the society. Now, there are other things. Of course, the, the New Yorker to me is one of the great, is one of the great, uh, uh, telltale objet d'art of our world. Uh, how many times have you picked up the New Yorker and you dive into it and the next thing you know, you find yourself with that little vague buzzing sound in your ears. You're reading about another Indian lady who is once again reminiscing about her Indian girlhood. Uh, or you're reading uh, another uh, Irish lady reminiscing about her Irish girlhood. Or you're reading uh, a thin, tall uh, gentleman reminiscing about his Connecticut boyhood. <laughs> it goes, yeah, and it goes on and on and on, and you you, you wonder you wonder uh, where it'll ever end. Well, uh, who knows? Uh, these these uh, whether it'll, whether whether it'll ever end. Uh, you know what what difference does it make? Uh, the fact is, it's part of a, I think of a of a great evolutionary change coming over our world and our time, which is not being recorded, literally not being recorded, uh, possibly because we're all involved in it. It's very hard. You know, I wonder whether a guy at the time of the Renaissance wrote much about the fantastic Renaissance that was going on. All he knew was that he had an itch. 
You know, that's all. And other guys were yelling, oh, cut out with the pictures, will you? You know, <laughs> this one. Th did a man at the time of the Industrial Revolution, when it was really getting up, did he know he was involved in a vast, fantastic sweeping? No, not the individual, I suspect. Uh, occasionally, one or two guys flying high over society, like vultures or eagles, uh, whichever way you prefer to look at it. Uh, these guys did. They kept saying, this is a fantastic thing going on. And yet, during, during great sweeping moments in history, very few, even of the most uh, uh, astute people, recognize that such is happening. I'll never forget reading the uh, intro, uh, the first paragraphs, the first few opening sentences in a novel by Stendhal. Henri Bayle, the, the famous uh, French writer who was famed for his realism, by the way. It's a curious thing. He was famed for his realism. He was famed for his psychological insight. They said that he was one of the first guys, as a matter of fact, the, the forerunner to Freud himself. And so here was Stendhal. He opened it up, and he was talking. He was saying, uh, uh, Dear Reader of 1931. He was writing this in 1831. He was, uh, Dear Reader of 1931, you won't believe what it's, what it's like now at this time. Of course, obviously not. And in, he wrote this novel. Now, he also kept a journal where he wrote about his problems writing, you say. And uh, he wrote on that particular, that particular, that during this particular novel, that he was constantly being bothered, this famous writer. He was constantly being bothered because outside of his study where he was writing, there was a constant uproar going on. People were yelling and hollering and they were shooting at each other. He says, if they'd only cut out that racket, I could get on with my book. It was the French Revolution. And uh, to him, there was just a lot of racket going on out there, a lot of sore heads and fat heads going on and on. And, and he didn't really, really relate to this. He didn't see this scene happening. Now, this is a, you know, great man of his time. So if he didn't dig it, what do you think the slob on the street was doing? Uh, the slob on the street was just walking around scratching and spitting once in a while. That's about the extent of it. You know, I've talked to, I've talked to people who were, who were in countries. Uh, it doesn't make any difference what, you know, country, but I, I can name several. In countries at the time, tremendous events occurred. I mean things which will be recorded in history for 10,000 years and more. And the one thing that they have in common when you talk to them is that they didn't know it was happening. They were very confused about it all. And uh, they're the last guys you can ask about it, actually. Have you ever talked to anybody who was in Germany at the time Hitler was rising? Hey, you know, he's just a nut. There's a nut a kook down the street there. And they never heard about him until one day he was elected, you know. And the next thing you know, they're all off running tanks somewhere on the tundra. And uh, they didn't they didn't know what happened or what was going on until it was all over. Most of them, many of them. I, I'm not taking anybody off the hook, but this is true. Uh, in, in our time, for example, uh, there's no one, no one can deny that there has been since World War II uh, tremendous and sweeping sexual and moral and sociological changes. Of course, they're all the same, really. They're all bound up, so you can't really subdivide them into separate little classifications. And yet, I'll guarantee you, there are probably in this country, out of uh, 100 people walking around the streets, there are possibly 65 to 70 who, one, don't know anything's happened, Two, if they do think anything's happened, they'll say, Oh, well, uh, we'll get back to normal. Don't worry, you know, it's all the same. I believe that everything, uh, you know, everybody goes through cycles and the law. Or, and the third group, who feel that by yelling loud enough, it'll stop. <laughs> those those are the three different nations I find among the... Oh, and, and of course, there is a fourth group. And this is a very special group. This is the group that gets highly indignant if you ever point out that anything has happened and somehow blame you for it happening because you're pointing it out. That goes back to an old folk problem. Uh, how many of us grew up in families who believed that Uncle Charlie died only after they took him to the doctor and they started to fool around with him? In other words, they blamed Uncle Charlie's death on the doctor. This This is something perhaps that's more more common in that great inverted bowl of darkness, the Middle West out there, than it is here, although I don't suppose it is too uncommon. Is it? Do they, do they say that kind of stuff around here? But Don, you know, I, oh, many times, I can remember, I remember my aunts all sitting around and, and clucking, you know, they, they, they'd cluck and eat the bridge mix, and they're all playing bingo or whatever, that bunko, that was the game, they have a bell, they keep hitting, bunko, they holler, and they're all sitting around, and, and uh, they, were, they were clucking and yelling, and the reason they were clucking, I'm a little kid, you know, I'm 
fooling around under the day bed, and my kid brother's over behind the radiator whimpering, and, you know, life is going on. And I can, I can remember my Aunt Teresa saying, that's all right, you, I don't care what you say, Min. Min was her younger sister, whom she always ran over like a steamroller, see. Uh, that was my, my, sis, my mother's second sister. And I don't care, I don't care, Min, I don't care what they say. Ma was all right until she went to see Dr. Slicker. I know those, I, have, I don't trust those people, or what do they know? As a matter of fact, well, the only thing they can think of is cut them open, cut them open. Yes, yeah, you can't, uh, well, I'm a kid, you know, laying there under the day bed. And so I'm sure that millions of people grew up with a sneaking suspicion that trouble did not end in hospitals, it began. That trouble did not end in doctor's offices, that's where you found it. And uh, so even today, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, there's a reverse thing now that's going on. How many of you have watched these medical shows on television? Have you ever seen anybody come in with anything that wasn't serious? No wonder people are getting scared of doctors. <laughs> One of them, uh, the doctor, he said, listen, he says, we call this the Casey syndrome. And I said, what's the Casey syndrome? He says, well, people watch television and everybody has got a, a, a disease out of which they will never recover. He says, not only that, they've always got a disease that only one man in the world can cure them. It's Casey. And he says, everybody comes walking in. He says, and there I am. I'm a little short, fat guy. I'm not Casey. So automatically, they think I can't cure them. They like, they keep looking for Casey. Where's that angry doctor that comes and says, I don't care what you say, doctor. I'm going to operate. I'm a responsible. And the next thing you know, you know. So he says the Casey syndrome is the syndrome that many people have developed from watching television, that there's no such thing as a harmless disease. There's no such thing. Wouldn't it be great once if this guy comes in to Casey one time and he's worried, he's sweating, you know, and oh boy, he's just terrible symptoms. And, and, and Casey sits down and says, all right, now, you're going to have to be truthful with me. You know how Casey's always yelling at people. You're going to have to be truthful with me. Come on now. I don't have time to fool with you. You're like every other patient. And I say to you, you can either live or die when you walk into this office. And if you're going to live, you're going to tell me the truth. If you're going to die, that's your business. All right, Miss Barber, wheel in the scalpel. Well, all right, he sits there and says, well, well, Dr. Casey, I don't, I don't know how to express it. I am terrible. I, I wake up nights and I turn. I just, I got this pain down here in my, could it be cancer, doctor? I got this pain down here in my gut. Every morning I sat there today in the office and it's bigger and build up bigger. Oh, doctor, sit down. Strip. That's Casey, see. And then the announcer says, we'll be back with Ben Casey in just one minute. But first, a word from Whoopies. And then there's a one-minute spot, see. And then it comes in and you see the lights. It dials in the lights. The machines are going. And you see Casey with his white coat. He's looking at the patient that's stretched out. And the patient's so, doctor, doctor, please, please, don't. Don't tell, tell Madge. Madge's heart is weak and she couldn't stand it. Oh, I know what's wrong with me. It's all right, doctor. You're going to be truthful with me, but don't tell Madge. And Casey looks at him and says, all right. Sit down. Turn up the lights, Miss Barber. Okay. I'm going to lay it out to you straight. You know what your trouble is, Jackson? What, 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 what? Oh, please, doctor, please don't tell Madge. Don't, 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 don't. Please, please. All right, Jackson, you know what your trouble is? I'm going to talk out plain and straight. I'm going to lay it down. Type BVDs. Bum, 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 bum. Yes, the case of Jackson and the tight underwear was solved once again by Dr. Ben Casey, who realized immediately that his pain was coming from the elastic band that pressed into his liver. That uh, Wouldn't that be a great series right there? With real problems? Do you realize that I know I have a friend? I'll tell you a true story. I had a friend that thought he was getting cancer. True, I'm telling you a true story. And he went out and he, he crept around and he got all these little fly by night insurance companies, you know, where you can buy five million dollars worth of insurance with no with no examination. He bought millions of dollars worth of this. Now I'm telling you a true story. He was scared. Oh boy, he walked around and he sweated and he cried. And gradually, everybody around him convinced him that he ought to go to the doctor. He'd seen plenty of Casey series, you know. He saw plenty of, of, of Medic. 
He knew what cancer was like. He knew where he knew those 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 sudden shooting pains deep down inside that you can't quite localize. He knew he had it. There was no question about it. And one day he says, All right, get off my back, I'll go find out. Forty five minutes later he came back with a funny look on his face. They traced it to his car. His front car seat was jabbing him right to the left of his spine, and it was giving him an ache that went from the top of his head all the way down to his feet. It was his car that was doing to him. And so, would Casey ever bring that kind of a case out? I doubt it very much. And that's what's known as the Casey Syndrome over here at University Hospital. And they can tell a Casey Syndrome patient when he comes walking in. He's got a kind of vague halo-like look around the eyes from hours of sitting in front of the tube. He's got the wide, dilated irises of a man who is accustomed to a 21-inch world. And he comes in there vaguely groping because he's in the daytime for the first time in years. Immediately, somebody says, here comes Casey. Watch out. Watch out. And all the doctors, by the way, are working on techniques to overcome that. They're working on scowls. They're working on leers. Many of them are taking voice lessons. I know one guy who's studying with Stella Adler. They're working out their best way they can find to deal with the Casey patients. Oh, by the way, most of their doctor's rooms now are being lit by Gene Rosenthal. So the guy knows he's in a real operating room. This is WOR Radio, your station for news.